about the tabernacle. And uh, I put a, a slide on the screen to show you what an artist's rendering has uh, envisioned what it might have looked like if you were looking like down from a drone or something, which didn't exist then. But the, the tent, it was basically a mobile tent that they could take wherever they went, the children of Israel, while they were in the wilderness. And it was um, a, a place where God dwelled, literally. God's presence was in the Holy of Holies. And the high priest was the one who could go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. But there were a lot of other things in the tabernacle that are so important and that we can see paralleled in the New Testament. It's kind of amazing, and I hope that you're, I'm a geek, I'm a geek, I'm a Bible geek, um, that you'll be able to see with me. So when Moses went up on the mountain and got the Ten Commandments, and he came down, and the people had taken that some of their gold and made a golden calf, and he got really mad, and he slammed the Ten Commandments down and broke them because the people were worshiping this golden calf, because even though God brought them through the, uh, away from the Egyptians and through the Red Sea, they, they, they would be really faithful one minute, and then the next minute they lost, they lost confidence in the Lord, and and while Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days, they were like, what's happening? And so they said, let's have another God. And Aaron, I don't know why Aaron did this, because he was a leader, and he let them bring their gold and form it into a gold calf, and they worshiped. And then when Moses came down, he saw it happening, and he was angry, and he threw the things down. That's my version. <laughs> so Moses went up on the mountain again, got another copy, <laughs> another set of scrolls with the Ten Commandments on it, and he also got really specific directions on building a tabernacle, a tent of meeting, the place where God would dwell. Why in the world would God want to dwell with such a fickle people? Yeah! <laughs> because God, more than anything, wants to have relationship with us. Mary, did you have a thought? Was that a hand or just a... Okay. <laughs> I'm amazed. And, and the one text that I want to, to share, one of the texts I want to share, I copied. And it's from um, Ezekiel 29. And this is what he said to, to Moses. Then I will live among the people of Israel and be their God, and they will know that I am the Lord their God. I am the one who brought them out of the land of Egypt so that I could live among them. I am the Lord their God. God Almighty, Yahweh, so, um, so divine that they could not even speak the word Yahweh, nor could they write it because it was too holy, wanted to dwell among his people even though they had showed themselves. They'd been a little bit ugly. But God said, I want you to build this tabernacle. And oh my goodness, if you look into like chapter 25 through about 38 of Ezekiel, there are really specific directions. What kind of wood to make out of? What to, to make things out of brass, brass hooks, how tall, how wide? Um, where to place things. It was very specific. I'm going to hit the high points, okay? So last week, we introduced the idea of the tabernacle. Now, after the tabernacle and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and Moses wasn't allowed to go in because when they got to the edge of the promised land, they sent Joshua and Caleb and 12 spies in 12 altogether, I think. And when they got there, they saw really tall guys, giants, and they saw huge grapes and plentiful bounty, milk and honey so high that the grapes were so heavy they had to carry them on, on poles. And, and um, when they came back and gave the report, I, I love this, the 10 of them said, oh, we can't go. We could never overcome those giants. And, but two, Joshua and Caleb said, give me this mountain. We can do this, Moses. Moses was leery and doubtful and at that point got a punishment from God saying that you're going to go to the edge. You can look into the promised land, but you're not going to get to go in. 
because you doubted. So after that, they wandered 40 years. Joshua got to carry them into the promised land. So once they got to the promised land, they didn't need, I mean, this, I'm, I'm condensing time into a very itty bitty time thing here, but they got to the promised land and ultimately they built the temple, Solomon's temple, and it was patterned after this. So I want to just tell you a little bit about it. Um, so this is called the outer court. There was one gate, one way in. But it was wide. It was 32 feet. The only entrance. Now, I have made New Testament parallels so far for the Old Testament examples. So here's the New Testament parallel for that gate. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So he is that gate. There was one way into the temple or the tabernacle. Once you came in, you immediately had to offer or needed to, chose to offer a pure sacrifice um, for your sins. And that is called the bra uh, brazen altar. And it was brass and it was reminiscent or it causes us to think of the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, which starts us on our journey, which accepting that, that decision. So you make the decision to give Jesus a try. You come in and you accept his sacrifice. He becomes the ultimate sacrifice. And we know that in the Old Testament times, they lived under a sacrificial system. So literally, they took perfect sheep, and they gave grains, and they, the priests offered them on the sacrificial altar. They burned them for the forgiveness of sin. Now, if you look in Hebrew, which talks a lot about the temple and Christ being the high priest, the tabernacle, the tabernacle, it talks about Jesus doing away with that sacrificial system and becoming the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus replaces the sacrificial system, dies once and for all for our sins, and we don't have to every day wake up, purchase a perfect goat, and sacrifice it. Um, we don't have to do that. We don't have to live by the 623 laws that they attempted to live by in the Old Testament. So we are under grace, unmerited favor. We get it even though we don't deserve it. That's what it's all about. Okay. So you see the parallel for today in that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Then last week, I got such a kick out of talking about the labor. Now, my descriptions that I read of the labor said it was two-tiered, and I have another picture. But I have to say my... my 21st century mind messed up a little bit last week because I read in uh, Exodus 28 8 that the women gave their brass mirrors or copper mirrors to the women who were attendants at the gate gave up their mirrors they no longer needed to look at themselves or care about their outward appearance so that they could build the laver laver which was a basin for washing I kind of had this picture of little mirrors, but as I did more research this week, they pounded all of the copper into one big copper, or would it be copper or brass? I forget. Something shiny that you can see your reflection in. And in Exodus it says that the priests had to wash their feet and their hands before they went into the holy place, or they would die. And so we compared the labor to the act of baptism, where, yeah, you get in the water, and if you've got dirt on your skin, it will come off. But really, that's about spiritual cleansing. It's about cleansing the inner person. So Jesus took that 
idea and, and because of his sacrifice, he, we are, we go through the waters of baptism to align ourselves with Jesus and to represent the cleansing of our sin. Okay, so this is the outer court. The first little area is called the holy place. Then back here is the holy, the holy of holies. And right in between, there's a veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. Big, there's big stories about the veil that you're going to hear about next week. Um, but today we're going to focus on two objects. Okay, this is last week. Um, the burnt offerings, which is the where we would offer the sacrificial lambs. And then there's a picture of the laver with two levels. Here's another diagram. And what we're going to focus on today is the idea of these two objects. And they are cool. On, I think this is the south side, there was a big golden lampstand. And then on the north side, there was a table with what they called showbread. Now, that's our focus for today. And you're going to see the parallels. First, the lampstand. What do we use light for, guys? We use it to see if we didn't have light, we would certainly bump our knees in the night or we could not move through life. Uh, it's a complex process. I mean, what if light didn't happen on the earth? Would our, Keith, would our plants be able to grow? Because photosynthesis would not be able to happen. So it's important for growth. And photosynthesis is a chemical uh, process that happens that allows a plant to grow. If you don't have life, it doesn't happen. So in this holy place, the first room, there were a lot of number, a number of daily tasks that the priest took, took care of. So at this time, Aaron and his sons were the, the big wig priests the high priest, and then the tribe of Levi were the helper, helpers. And then the um, rest of the tribes camped out around the tabernacle, and it went everywhere they went, and it was in the middle of all the people. Um, the priests performed daily duties. The golden lampstand was the only light other than daylight and it was lit all of the time. It never went out. Part of their duty was keeping that going, and the contributions from the tribes gave oil to keep it going. There weren't candles. There were wicks and oil, olive oil. So the light of the tabernacle. Now, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. So the modern day parallel of that lampstand would be Holy Scripture, giving us direction. What does it do for us? It, well, let me just tell you what it was made of. And it's so specific. It was made of 76 pounds of gold. They must have had a lot of jewelry. But there were thousands of people there. So they took the gold, they melted it into one big piece of gold, and they formed this, this candlestick. And it was always lit. Now, I will say that that candlestick is diff the one the one that I have a picture of is actually different from what the description is, but I couldn't find another picture. But there was actually um, seven branches with things with more than that light coming out. Um, so 
If it weren't for the lampstands, the priests would have to do their stuff in the dark. What does that lampstand, the word of God, do for us today? A light for our path. It's in this word of God that we get to see who Jesus is. We see the best example of the revelation of God through Jesus. Now, God has revealed himself in several ways. There's this thing called general revelation where you can see God through nature. You can see God in, um, in several ways, but specific revelation of God is through the doctrine or the idea of Jesus coming to earth as a human, as a man, to live as we have lived. He is the best picture of God that we see. It says that the benefit of studying the word is learning the truth. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set, south, shall set you free, according to the Gospel of John. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's how we know what to do. It's how we know how to live. If you want to know, look at the Word of God. It's like that mirrored copper gives us the ability to evaluate ourselves. It says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the soul, dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrows, judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's from Hebrews. And then it also gives us weapons to use against the evil one, Satan. It says the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Now, if you recall, in Ephesians, Paul gives us the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet of peace. Um, but the only defensive piece of the armor for the Christian is the sword and it is the word of God that's the only offensive I got the wrong word offensive peace everything else is defensive but the sword is offensive so that tells me that with the sword the light of God's word that we are able to fight Satan I like to do it like Jesus did it I quote scripture why should we memorize verses in the Bible so we can quote them to Satan when he tempts us? I learned as an, a young child to say the verse, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And the Philippian verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I whisper those out loud when I am on the offense or when I just need to put Satan in his place. The word of God gives us direction. You know, we use GPS systems in our cars. Those are called global positioning satellites. And they are like a computer that tell us they know where things are. But sometimes, if, have you guys been following your GPS and ended up in like, uh, like a wrong street? One time I was in southern Indiana trying to get a bunch of kids home from Holiday World and we were trying to get to the interstate and we ended up on this road that dead ended. We could see the interstate, but there was no road to get to the interstate. We were following the GPS. <laughs> so sometimes that GPS is misleading. But spiritually, God's positioning satellite the word of God does not lead you to a dead end. It helps you to be where you need to be. Psalm 11911. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do you want to stop sinning? The answer is hiding God's word in your heart through reading, repetition, memorization, study. Now, interestingly, in the Gospel of John, 
John, oh John, he's so different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I love John. He's a radical. He has this opening paragraph that compares Jesus, calls Jesus the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So at that point, uh, John is comparing Jesus to the word, and that he was the word made flesh, and that the world didn't understand him. Well, we know that. That's true, right? The world didn't get him. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. We're told in the book of Revelation that in heaven, we won't need lamps because Jesus will be the light. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives a light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Amen. Okay, I want to talk just a minute about the table that has the showbread. Okay, just look at that for a second. (laughs) What does that look like? What does it look like, guys? It looks like the sacraments. It looks like the um, communion table. (laughs) Looks like pancakes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, And there were several different examples of this, but what we know is there were 12. They were uh, representative of each tribe. In the bowl on top is frankincense. I haven't figured out what the liquid is. I'll keep working. Nobody said it so far, but anybody know what the liquid was? Water, maybe. Holy water. Um, Anybody know? So... What you see here, and here's the interesting part. Every week, each tribe offered a perfectly made piece of showbread that was made with very specific recipes and instructions. And it sat on the showbread table until the Sabbath of the next week. At that point, the priest switched it out with the new, and they lived off of it. They ate it. And it wasn't dry, it wasn't moldy, it wasn't stale. So kind of an ongoing miracle there. And it's reminiscent that Jesus was our bread of life. When we come to the communion table, we break the bread, we take it together, We realize that what God did for us, we remember Jesus' death. We drink together the cup that memorializes Jesus' blood. So this was the beginning of that. That's our New Testament version of the showbread. Isn't that cool? I mean, if you look at the tabernacle, you see... All the major elements of our spiritual life today. And wait till we get next week to the altar of incense and the veil. And then we're going to end it up the following week with the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. So, this isn't just in there for happenstance. It's there for us to look at how Jesus truly was the fulfillment of the prophecies Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that he was the answer to. And the beginnings of our faith today, the practices that we have from baptism to um, offering sacrifices and, and covering ourselves with the blood of Christ. Now, as Baptists, I love being Baptist. The one difference that is significant is that we don't have a high priest, we are priests to each other. Priesthood of the believer. I can go directly to God. I don't have to have another person. I can go to my brother or my sister. I can confess. They can offer counsel. 
We can go to the Bible and through the Holy Spirit read it, find direction. It's often helpful to have somebody with you on that journey, but it's not a part of the equation to have a priest offer us Forgiveness as a mediator between heaven and us. Jesus is the only mediator that we need. I find that just awesome, first of all. And that's part of what I love about being Baptist. Um, there's so many things I could say. Uh, a lot of people base the whole idea of sprinkling in the Christian faith around the world on that um, baptismal laver, laver, and that's why they don't immerse. But we follow where Jesus was in the Jordan River, and we follow that model. You know what? Those, in my mind, are fringe. The, the, the important part is Jesus. Um, I want to close with an illustration. This is literally a light that has been burning continuously from 1901. So how many years is that? 120? 121. This light has literally been burning in California for 121 years. It's in Livermore, California. It's been moved several times, and the people in the town take great great uh, pride in the fact that they have this, this long-standing light. It was first installed in a firehouse in 1901, moved to a second firehouse in 1903. It survived the renovation of that firehouse in 37. In 76, it was moved with full police and fire truck ex ex escort to another fire station. It was then hooked up to a separate power source with no interruptions, where they recognized it as the oldest burning light bulb by the Guinness Book of World Records. There have been, uh, they were so enamored with it and concerned, they have put webcams on it. And in May, uh, let's see, the worldwide webcam went down once and the bulb stayed on. <laughs> the light bulb has even outlived the computer server that it was connected to. According to the website, there's a new camera and server ready to go so that you can see this light bulb. I'm gonna get online and see if I can see it live. What a light. I wanna be like that light bulb. I wanna just keep shining. But the reality is I'm not the light. I am not the light. There was a man who was asked what the meaning of life was and he pulled out his wallet and in that wallet he pulled out a little sliver of a mirror and he said, I'm not the light, but I am to reflect the light. And that's what mirrors do. We're not the light, we're the reflector of the light. We bear evidence to the light. We share with the world what the light has caused us to see. And we are benefactors of the light. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus, for these examples in this remarkably detailed and meaningful map of the tabernacle and what you're teaching us through it. What the real majors are, not the minors, that Jesus is the non-negotiable in our lives and that we are to reflect that life. It is in his name that we pray today. Amen. We're going to sing an invitation song. And that is how firm a foundation is Jesus 275, how firm a foundation. I'm going to put on my mask. I'm going to ask if there are people who would like prayer or to make a decision for Christ to come during the singing of this hymn. As you stand, let's sing together, how firm a foundation.